Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined for a second time by Dr. Thibaut Ruta. He is Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Maribor, and I'm leaving the, his other affiliations in the description box of the interview. Uh, and uh, in our first talk, we talked about his great book, Capitalism for Realists. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box as well. And today we're focus on, uh, focusing on his other book, Rational Choice and Democratic Government, a sociological approach. And we're basically talking about democracies, what it is to live in a democracy, what is a liberal democracy, some aspects of human decision making that are really important to understand and play a role in democracies and stuff like that. So Dr. Ruther, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to everyone. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me on again, Ricardo. So uh, whenever people talk about democracy, I mean, democracy is not always exactly the same thing, because sometimes we're thinking about, for example, democracy in, in ancient Greece. Uh, sometimes we're talking about uh, modern contemporary democracies. So uh, what do we know about the earliest democracies? How, how far back does democracy go? And what were perhaps some of the main differences between the earliest democracies and the liberal democracies we have today? Yeah, there's a great book on this topic that I would recommend, and I also reference it in my book. Uh, the author is David Stasevich, and the title, I think, is The Decline and Rise of Democracy, which is quite suggestive. So he starts with the decline of democracy, which presumes that there were democracies before that, and then the decline, and then in the past two centuries, another rise. Uh, so yeah, what Stasevich shows is that, surprisingly perhaps, there were many small-scale tribal societies, even thousands of years ago, uh, two thousand or, or even more uh, like uh, the Germanic tribes in Europe or the various small scale tribal societies in North America before the arrival of European settlers like the Iroquois Indians or the Huron Indians. And all of them practiced what we could call early forms of democracy. So they didn't, of course, have any uh, such institutions like uh, formal elections of political leaders and functionaries, no adult suffrage or uh, liberal rights guarantees. But there was quite a lot of power sharing going on, and in that sense, they were democratic. So the overarching leaders of uh, various collectivities of tribes had to cede a certain degree of power to local um, councils and assemblies, which were made up of uh, ordinary tribes people, sometimes higher ranking, higher status tribes uh, elders, but uh, other times just ordinary tribes people. And there was, like I said, a lot of power sharing going on. Um, these were, of course, illiterate tribes, so they didn't read any ancient philosophers uh, talking about and giving arguments for democracy. They just found that uh, democracy makes sense as a form of governance, given their conditions, given their environment, their small scale nature, of course. And the fact that you can't gather as a leader, you can't gather information uh, without ceding some amount of power to local assemblies who then give you, in exchange for that power, give you uh, information that they know best. And you as a leader who is sometimes remote uh, can't have access to. Um, like you said, these were so uh, these were quite different from modern liberal democracies. We'll talk about what even liberal democracy means today. Uh, mm -hmm. But I should also mention that um, uh, there's an interesting duality in human history. So on the one side, like we just talked about, you had these early forms of democracy throughout human history thousands of years ago. And so in one sense, you could say that democracy might be a default, a nature, a natural state of uh, human affairs. But on the other hand, don't forget about what I mentioned at the start of my book, and that is that when it comes to large scale societies, what some people refer to as civilizations or state societies, now there, democracy is definitely not the default state. The state societies have now existed for around five to 7,000 years, and they were almost without exception autocratic or dictatorial in nature uh, but, uh, until maybe a century or two centuries uh, ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so let's get into liberal democracies then. Mm. So what exactly is a liberal democracy and basically what kinds of political and civil rights does it include? 
Yeah, I, I'd say that liberal democracy is simply the name we give to those political regimes in the world which offer the highest amount of rights that are protected and the most robust um, uh, manner in which those rights are protected. And then the rights of which I'm talking about are, like you said, uh, can be classified as political and civil. Uh, political rights are usually the rights that we have in mind when discussing democracy, so uh, the right to, uh, to, to um, uh, have a regular, fair and free elections of political leaders and functionaries, the rights to assembly, so to, to form groups and um, uh, coalitions like uh, trade unions and political parties and special interest groups, uh, the right um, or, or a realistic chance of the opposition to win an election and to oust the incumbent, those are political rights. And liberal democracies offer the, the highest number or, or the, the highest amount of those rights and the best protections for them. And then on the other hand, you have civil rights, uh, which are more society centered. So um, the right to free and independent media, the right to free expression, to freely practicing one's religion or non-religious belief, the rule of law, uh, equality in, uh, in, uh, in the eyes of the law, uh, then the various protections against the gender discrimination, the right of workers to strike. So very encompassing set of rights. And those are also all included under this umbrella term of liberal democracy. And then you could also say that you have other more minimalistic types of democracy that currently exist. So not liberal democracies, but electoral democracies. Mm -hmm. Electoral democracies offer quite robust protections of political rights, but less so of civil rights. And um, you have everything in between. So you have electoral democracies, you have liberal democracies, and then you have a mixture of one and the, the other. And then, of course, on the, on the other pole, you have autocracies. And here again, you can talk about closed autocracies and electoral autocracies. And again, electoral autocracies, which are closer to electoral democracies, have some protections of political rights, let's say, but not really civil rights. And then closed autocracies, such as China or Russia, now those have almost no either political or, or civil rights. Uh, just to make this a little bit clearer for mm -hmm. the audience, could you give us an example of an electoral democracy? Yeah, sure. I think uh, Croatia, the neighboring country to, to my home country of Slovenia, Croatia would be an electoral democracy. Maybe Portugal, maybe Portugal would be, or Slovenia, they would be somewhere in between electoral and liberal democracies, or maybe 10 years ago before the onset of the democratic recession, about, about which we'll speak in a moment, mm -hmm. um, both Portugal and Slovenia were liberal democracies, but then they sort of kind of became a bit more precarious. So they are, uh, in, let's say, between electoral and uh, liberal democracy. And then for an example, example of an electoral autocracy, you could mention Turkey, Erdogan's Turkey or uh, Orban's Hungary. Hungary was a liberal democracy 10 years ago, but now it has been downgraded first to electoral democracy and then now in the past few years to electoral autocracy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and we'll get more into detail into that when we talk about the democratic recession yeah. and also how we evaluate levels of democracy ac across countries. So, mm -hmm. But uh, can we say that democracies have, generally speaking, been on the rise over time? Generally, they have been on the rise, historically speaking. So like I said uh, in answering your first question, throughout human history, when it comes to state societies, democracies were the exception. Maybe ancient Greece and ancient Athens and so on, but, but even there, uh, th those were small scale state societies, city, city states. So those, I don't think that they count. Uh, but large scale, large scale state societies were uh, autocracies throughout human history. And then in, let's say, the second half of 19th century, so around 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, then you get the first emergence of liberal and electoral democracies. Switzerland and France and the United Kingdom, of course, they started becoming democratic in the second part of the 19th century. But still, almost all political regimes at that time were uh, dictatorial. Then in the 20th century, um, things really start going. And so in 19, uh, 1920s, just before Second World War, you have, let's say, around 10 liberal democracies, depending on how you measure it in the world. And um, you have uh, further another 10 or 15 electoral democracies uh, at that time in the world. And then nothing much happens in the uh, next 20 years. You have the World War II, you have um, the rise of fascism. So obviously democracy was uh, in a bad spot at that time. But then after Second uh, World War ended, uh, again, there, there was a 
steady increase in democracies throughout the world, so that by the end of the Cold War, in the late 1980s, we could say that there was uh, around 50 uh, liberal and electoral, electoral democracies in total in the world. And then, of course, with the collapse of the Soviet empire, uh, another explosion of democracy happened in 1990s, so that by the early 2000s, we could say that half of all political regimes in the world, around, around 100 countries, could be classified as uh, democratic in one form uh, or another. And so what is it that people have been recently calling the democratic recession? What yeah. is that and why did that happen? Yeah, so that is the unfortunate tendency or the obverse tendency of what we were just discussing right now. So we had this historic rise of democracy. And then in the early 2000s, when we reach a historic peak, then slowly you get this um, leveling off phenomena. There is uh, no further growth in democracies uh, in the world. Of course, in each year, there are some new democratic transitions that are successful. But because there are also reversals, there are also democratic collapses on net, on average, since about 2007 or 2008, depending on the metric you use, there has not been uh, an additional growth of democracy. We've stagnated uh, at about 100 or 90 democracies per year. And then in the past 10 years, so from 2013 or 2015 onwards, we could even uh, talk about a declining trend, not just a stagnation, but a decline. Uh, we now, I think, are uh, at the same in the same conditions that we were in the middle of 1990s. So we have regressed a bit. We, we went back in time uh, a few years or maybe a decade as far as the number of democracies democracies is concerned. And, and, and this would be the democratic recession, simply the reduction in the number of democracies throughout the world. But also there are other aspects of the democratic recession. You could say that the overall level of freedom measured as um, political and civil rights, how many there are in the world, in democracies and autocracies, how well they are protected, uh, those, those uh, freedoms have also been on the decline. So that means that even countries that have not regressed from democracy to autocracy, even countries that are still democratic, they have they have seen their rights kind of crumble a bit. And uh, autocratic states like Russia and China, they have also, they have remained autocratic in the past uh, 20 years, but they have also become more autocratic over time. That would also be an as aspect of democratic recession. And then lastly, we could also say that if you measure people's opinion in democracies or in autocracies throughout the world, their opinion about the importance of democracy, their attitudes toward a strman leaders, toward populists, uh, toward the liberal rights and so on, uh, these opinions have also been a bit precarious. So more uh, a higher share of populations today compared to a decade ago say that democracy is not all that important or that we don't have to really bother with parliaments and supreme courts when we, we elect a new strong leader. And that would also, I think, be a, a part of the democratic recession. Let me just mention one other thing I just remembered right now, Ricardo, as you um, as you see in the book, um, I also go to some lengths to emphasize that the democratic recession has in some outlets uh, been overstated. Some scholars have made a moral panic out of it. I think it's a harmful phenomenon. I think it's a real phenomenon. We should be worried about it. But you can overstate the, um, the, democrat the extent of the democratic recession. And I show in the book that, at least on some measures, even though things haven't improved, they have also not regressed uh, as strongly as some people make it out to be. But there's a very interesting thing that you said there. And, and uh, I mean, part of my answer was also about why it happened. So uh, at a certain point there, you mentioned that depending on how you measure things, the democratic re recession started happening in around 2007, 2008. And 2008 was the year of the economic crisis. So do we have any idea if that had anything to do with it? Yeah, that's a good question. And yes, we do. We do have an idea. So various exogenous shocks, social shocks like the global economic recession, or a few years later, if you remember it in 2015, the European migrant crisis, all of those exogenous shocks can influence voters to shift their opinions, to shift their attitudes, and to maybe start voting for various right and left wing populist leaders who promise easy fixes in no time. N none of this um, 
um, 10 years of struggling with um, various courts and appeals and um, uh, all these formal channels and institutions, I alone can make you better off the people in a few years. So, of course, the, the rise of Erdogan and uh, Viktor Orban and uh, Donald Trump, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, and all these people, they have been at the forefront uh, of attacks against democracy and they have been bolstered. They have been bolstered by the economic crisis, by the migrant crisis, by various wars and, and, and so on. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are even studies out there that show that whenever people are exposed to uh, a, pol a political, political, economic or social in uh, instability, then they tend to prefer authoritarian uh, political leaders. Yeah, yeah, and that can happen even for evolutionary psychological reasons, mm -hmm. not just reasons to do with rational, deliberate thinking. Yeah, that's very important. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but how do we evaluate the level of democracy across countries? So, for example, you mentioned, we, or we talked about in the beginning of the interview uh, about uh, political and civil rights. Does that have anything to do with it? So, for example, do we look across countries and see if they respect uh, these or that number of political and civil rights and give, give them a score, for example? How does it go exactly? exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you have various uh, inst institutes and think tanks like Freedom House, the Economist Intelligence Unit, the Varieties of Democracies, Regimes of the World, and so on. These are all institutions or organizations that produce, like you said, various indexes of measuring um, civil, civil rights, uh, political rights, other aspects of uh, democracies for every year for each individual country over time. And uh, they, of course, also score uh, autocratic regimes on, on, let's say, a scale going from 0 to 100 or 0 to 10 or 0 to 1. And then we can, rain, uh, we can rank these various regimes uh, by how well they protect various rights. So you have these subjective indicators. These are, of course, um, expert uh, evaluations. You have varieties of democracy. The, the institution has thousands and thousands of social science experts across the world from virtually every society, every country, and they have various levels, um, um, the national level, regional, continental, global level, and various experts on these different levels, and they have to coordinate between each other. They make arguments for and against reducing a certain country's score in one or the other year, and they, they uh, deliberate a lot, and and then they decide at the end uh, on what score they'll give uh, each individual country. And, and some critic would say, well, OK, that makes sense. But these are, again, subjective evaluations. How can we make sure that they accurately reflect reality? And yeah, there, there is some concern about that. So we can also look at, and they do look at, objective indicators like um, power turnover or election suspensions or the number of arrests of journalists over time. Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? And those are also indicators of how well democracies are doing in their various aspects. Again, when it comes to uh, the, the core of democracy, that is having elections, uh, when it comes to free and independent media, media are a, an extremely important pillar of democratic power or democratic governance. So you can, I, I think the best way to go about it is to combine these subjective and objective indicators, because Ricardo, think about um, Viktor Orban or these other populists, they know that they mustn't suspend elections or they can just blatantly arrest uh, journalists. This happens in Russia, but it, it can't really happen or it has to be hidden in Hungary. So they, mm, they tackle other aspects of democracy that are harder to measure objectively. So you do need to refer to those more softer subjective measures as well if you want to get a fuller picture. And so let me ask you about one specific example that, uh, as far as I understand it, it's probably uh, not as easy to measure, but probably it has some impact on certain aspects of democracy and also to know if people take that into account or not. So, for example, even if workers uh, are, uh, have a politically protected right to form a workers' union, let's say, but within uh, or across different companies in a given country, uh, I mean, the, com uh, the company's management or the CEO or some people who, or the owners of the company are actively trying to undermine workers' efforts to form workers' unions. I mean, mm -hmm. would that count as having uh, less democracy, at yeah. least in that particular aspect, even though the right is still politically there and politically 
protected, but it's not politicians themselves undermining the right, but in this case, companies, owners or managers or whoever. Example. Yeah, that's so important. That's so important. Thanks for that question. Yes, exactly. So you can look at uh, Freedom House's indicator. Uh, Freedom House has a separate category ranging from a score of zero to four, four meaning the best protection and zero meaning almost no protection, um, a category that measures exactly what you mentioned. So uh, can workers unionize? Is this just a formal right existing on, uh, on a piece of paper? Uh, is it actively being pursued? Are there some uh, groups of people like politicians fighting against it, and then you get a different score as a country uh, regarding or um, um, depending on where you are in this spectrum from vir virtually zero worker recognition to uh, workers and their efforts to collectively organize, being recognized actively, being promoted, not just formally on a piece of paper. Uh, so yeah, that is definitely a part of it. And you can say that um, a, a country's democratic score is lowered if uh, workers are being undermined in that aspect. Mm -hmm. So liberal democracy, can we say that it is a stable system? And uh, I mean, more generally, how do we, uh, how can we tell if a system is stable or not? Yeah, I think it is a stable system. I think it's actually the most stable of all political regimes that we have on offer, even though it seems that autocracies, especially closed autocracies like China, are extremely robust, extremely um, resistant to fragility. In actuality, usually authoritarian systems, China uh, here may be um, an uh, exception, but usually dicta dictatorial systems are very fragile underneath, under the surface. And that is why so many people and even scholars were surprised at the end of the Cold war when the Polish dictatorship, a brutal dictatorship, collapsed overnight virtually in a matter of few weeks or months and East, East Germany also as a dictatorship collapsed almost immediately because these were at, uh, at their core very fragile systems. People are so frustrated that they just wait for a chance to, to rebel against it. But yeah, liberal democracies are very stable and I'd say that empirically we can, we can notice by just looking at statistics from the past 70 years, for example, no liberal democracy. Hungary here might be an exception, but, but the only exception that sort of proves the rule. Um, so in the last 70 years, uh, no wealthy liberal democracy had ever collapsed. Uh, this, you, this is a, a, an extremely important fact because um, um, the, the regimes that are not democratic or uh, poor democracies, electoral democracies, have a lifespan of sometimes just eight or ten years. So going on for, for 70 or 100 or 150 years, in the case of the United States, there, that I think speaks to stability. Now we can also look at theoretical arguments. I'd mentioned just two reasons. One is more extrinsic and one is more intrinsic to liberal democracy. So the, the more extrinsic reason has to do with the fact that um, all existing liberal democracies are also the most economically developed or advanced societies in the world where people are most well off materially. And uh, this is not necessarily tied to democracy, but it, it's just a, a strong association that exists. And it makes people in such systems more reluctant to rebel against the status quo. Of course, people in liberal democracies have their grievances. They sometimes take to the streets. They protest against polit politicians and policies. But they know, these people realize that they're very uh, well off materially and that uh, destroying a liberal democracy would also kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. So that's why people protest, but they don't really rebel in a revolutionary fashion against liberal democracies. They're just so well off materially. Now, the second more intrinsic reason has to do with the fact that by definition, liberal democracies allow protest liberal democracies allow dissent. So when people are frustrated, which I just said that they usually aren't because these systems are so uh, good for them materially, but when they are, um, uh, they, when they have some problems with the system in which they live, they just take to the streets, they protest, and they are not uh, met with uh, violent repression, with arrests, with um, killings. Uh, the, the, the police doesn't come out and shoot them, which happens in dictatorships, in autocracies. Look at China, look at Russia. Uh, 
there people are also frustrated, even much more than in liberal uh, democracies, because those regimes don't work as well. And when they go to, uh, the, to the streets to air their grievances, they're met with violent repression. This uh, does curtail protest in the uh, short term, but over the long term, people just get more frustrated. And the biggest weakness autocr of autocracies is that over time, people get so frustrated that they are willing to do um, unspe unspeakable acts, like uh, put themselves on fire, like uh, Mohammed Bouazizi did in Arab Spring, at the start of the Arab Spring in Egypt or, or in Tunisia, sorry. Um, so in that sense, I think liberal democracies are much more um, uh, resistant to fragility than dictatorships over the long term. Okay, so before we get into other questions, uh, I think this would be a good point to introduce uh, some of the theoretical framework you apply in the book, particularly when it comes to understanding uh, the incentives and the decision making that operates uh, and plays a big role in, in people's behavior in democracy. And so what do you think are some of the most important questions to try to answer here when it comes to uh, incentives, what determines them and uh, questions like that? Yeah, like the title of my book says, I use rational choice theory to address these questions or to uh, generate a framework for myself upon which I'll then analyze people's behavior. And uh, like you mentioned, rational choice theory means a few things. So let me maybe mention just the three more most important um, pillars or principles of rational choice theory. The first is that um, we should assume that the ordinary person in ordinary circumstances is quite self-interested. This doesn't mean that people want to harm other people. This doesn't mean that people don't take care of their family or, or that they don't have friends who they deeply love and respect and want to want everything good for them. No, I take an, a broader evolutionary, psychologically informed perspective on human self-interestedness, which uh, takes heed of kin selection and uh, reciprocal altruism. So all of that, I think, has to do with self-interest. But what I want to say with that assumption or, or or what I do assert with that assumption is that uh, people usually don't go out of their way and incur, are not willing to incur a great personal costs just to help some anonymous stranger every day uh, regularly in, in a repeat fashion. In that sense, I would say people are primarily self-interested, not that they're psychopaths or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you can look at empirical evidence, and I do go through some of the experimental and statistical empirical evidence in the book on this topic. Just for example, you can uh, take a look at the most um, charitable countries in the world. Uh, surprisingly, the United States is usually at the top of the list. And you can uh, see just in these most charitable countries in the world, how large of a, uh, how, how, how big the share is that people give to uh, charitable donations out of their yearly income. And you see that this amounts to one or two percent. So 98% of people's income is spent on who? On themselves, on their friends and their family. I'd say that that's self-interested. And whatever it is, we, we don't even need to use that word self-interest. I just want to make people realize that fact. People want to help themselves, their friends, and their um, family members, not anonymous strangers. You can also look at volunteer work. You'll see that uh, only a minority people, even in the most charitable countries, only a minority of people perform regular volunteer work, so unpaid work for anonymous strangers. And even of those that do perform it, they usually just uh, perform an hour or so a week, whereas they perform 40 to 50 hours of paid work for themselves, for, for money that they can spend on themselves and their family. So the first pillar of rational choice theory is uh, that people should be assumed to be in ordinary circumstances self-interested. The second pillar is what you mentioned with reference to incentives. The second pillar is that people uh, pursue these self-interested goals in appropriate uh, ways. That is, they um, look at their environment and they ask themselves, what would be the best way of achieving my goal? So I have a certain goal and there are five alternative ways in which I could pursue that goal. And rational choice theory presumes that people People are willing and able to pick the best uh, means or the best uh, way of uh, pursuing their goal. And, and that, is, that, that is basically a more convoluted way of saying that people are, are responsive to incentives. And those incentives are, of course, shaped by their social environment, by the rules within which they live, laws, social norms, material structures, asymmetries and relations of power. 
Uh, and to give you just a, a trivial example to make that more concrete, my own students in the class are responsive to incentives. When I um, when I ask them to read some paper and write a report for me, so when I ask them to do their homework, if I don't stipulate any rules and if I don't give them any incentives, any rewards and punishments for doing that, then most of them uh, won't do the, the homework. Uh, they Or if they will do it, they won't do a good job of it. They'll just write something, send it in, and they don't care. Uh, there are a few students that always care, and they don't need any incentives, but most of them need incentives. But if I say to them, OK, so do this homework for me, and if you do it, and if you do a good job at it, you'll get a high grade, and you won't have to uh, complete my exam, which is much more difficult. And then you'll be able to finish this course in an easier way, and you'll get your diploma faster, and so on. Then all of a sudden, most of them perform the homework, and they do a good job of it. And, and uh, the same with punishments. If I say, if you don't do this homework, you'll fail my, my class, and you won't get the diploma. Again, they're much more inclined to do what I ask them uh, to do. And then lastly, I would just say that um, uh, when it comes to pernicious behavior, so when it comes to bad behavior, when politicians are doing corrupt deals, when they are screwing over the public, when capitalists engage in unsavory actions and so on, rational choice theory asks us to not try to deduce this bad behavior, this pernicious behavior, from uh, assuming bad psychology or bad intentions on the part of social actors. What a rational choice theory asks us is to, at first, at least at first glance, just say these are normal, normal people pursuing normal self-interested goals, but within an environment in which they are faced with bad incentives. Maybe they are trapped in a prisoner's dilemma, for example, where ordinary people people who just want to do the best they can are led or are motivated to do bad acts because the incentives are point, pointing in that direction. Again, I'm not denying that uh, no evil people exist in the world. I'm not denying that there are not psychopaths roaming around. There are, but uh, the ordinary person is not a psychopath. So when an ordinary person does something bad, your first instinct should be to look at the environment in which he is and maybe whether he's motivated to, to do a bad act instead of just assuming, well, he did a bad act because he's a bad person with bad intentions. That is, I think, another important lesson of rational choice theory. Yes, uh, and I mean, in this case, before I move on to the next question, just to clarify things a little bit here, because sometimes when we approach things from, for example, a uh, rational choice perspective or even a biological slash evolutionary perspective, it's very easy to get into a very bleak view of humanity and even nature and say that, I mean, if people are self-interested, then there's no altruism at all and they're just selfish or think that because genes are selfish then people are also selfish or something along those lines but i mean th that's not necessarily the case right it's not that even if people are self-interested they uh, that is uh, completely incompatible with altruism and uh, i mean as you mentioned there at a certain point i think that it's very clear that we can see that people uh, in general are much more decent and altruistic than at least what a misanthrope would expect. <laughs> Absolutely, that's an important point. Yeah, uh, we should clarify what we mean by the word altruism. So uh, if we are talking about pure altruism, which in evolutionary biological terms usually means that you incur some personal costs mm -hmm. and give benefits to other people, and this is never repaid to you in any kind, not in an indirect way, not in a direct way, not through reciprocity, not through signaling, none of that. Well, that is that is hard to explain how that could have evolved on evolutionary grounds. So in, in that pure ultra social way, I think humans are not usually uh, altruistic. There are some exceptions, but usually not. We are we are the wrong species for that. But that doesn't mean that there are there is no altruism in other ways. So when it comes to reciprocal reciprocal altruism, when I incur some personal costs and do something for you, but then at another point of time you incur some personal costs and give some benefits to me, or uh, for example a signaling or indirect um, uh, reciprocity, when I help you and again I incur some costs, so you get some benefits, and then you don't return the benefits to me, but maybe some other person starts associating with me because I did this 
this good act and that other person helps my prospects, that could also uh, explain how an uh, altruism of a kind can evolve and people do that type of altruism, uh, altruism all the time. So definitely, definitely, yeah. So earlier we talked about uh, the rise and spread of democracy, but what would be, or in your opinion, what would be the best explanation out there for that? Because there are different authors that point to different factors, different theories, explanations, but uh, how do you think is the best way for us to try to solve the puzzle of democracy? Yeah, at first I... I try to just focus on the most famous or the most popular explanation, but like you mentioned or like you implied, that won't suffice and I'll explain in a bit why it won't suffice. Uh, let me first get to uh, the democratic, the puzzle of democracy, like you said. Yeah, the puzzle of democracy is how is it possible that any democracy, any democratic regime has ever emerged if it is the case, like I said before, that every democracy, every democracy had to have emerged from previous autocratic conditions. So every currently existing democracy was 100 or maybe 200 years ago, was presided over by a narrow autocratic elite that in general should be powerful enough and not willing enough to um, allow for a successful democratic transition. Now, the most um, sociologically popular explanation or, or a solution for the, the puzzle of democracy is that um, this happens when ordinary people, the masses, workers and so on, rebel against the elite. So yeah, of course, the elite won't, uh, won't want to affect uh, a, a successful democratic transition, but maybe ordinary people, we, wa we want to do that because life under autocratic conditions is so bad. But this doesn't really work because as you know all too well, Ricardo, there are pervasive collective action problems, right? like the free rider problem on mm -hmm. the part of ordinary masses. The ordinary person living in autocracy can rationally think to himself or herself, why should I risk my life and limb going out to the street and fighting against the autocrat if I can just sit at home and let other people do the work? And if they're successful, I will also in the end enjoy the fruits of democracy because democracy is a universal good. Everybody gets democratic rights, even those people who didn't fight for democracy. And at the same, same time, this person can think to himself, if uh, those guys out there on the streets fighting for democracy uh, happen to fail, uh, okay, then I won't get any democratic benefits, but at least I won't be the one getting arrested or killed uh, protesting. So whatever happens, it's best for me to stay at home. This is a version of uh, the prisoner's dilemma, right? And if every person thinks that way, nobody fights for democracy and then you don't get the transition. So I would say at first glance, the solution to the puzzle of democracy is simply to say that, but this is a bit abstract, uh, democracies emerge when the ordinary people, the masses, are strong enough to resist against the autocratic elite and they're willing enough to overcome free rider problems and at the same time the autocratic elite is not strong enough to resist against the pressure coming from ordinary people and is willing, at least is somewhat incentivized to cede to their democratic demands. But then you would ask, okay, sure, but what are the exact conditions under which this happens? And I would say that the most famous sociological explanation is something that's called modernization theory. This most famous explanation says that when you have economic development, industrial development, uh, the, the creation of a modern economy, then you will see some structural changes which will increase the strength of ordinary people, will decrease the costs of collective action for them, and they will also, these modern uh, uh, changes in the social structure will disempower the presiding autocratic elite and will make it more willing to accept a democratic transition. So I would say that the main answer to the puzzle of democracy is economic development, which unleashes the power of ordinary people to struggle against the autocratic elite. That's very interesting. And since you mentioned the elites there, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent these would play a role here. And I mean, in this case, I'm going to talk mostly about revolutions, but of course, that's not the only way by which we transition from an autocracy to a democracy, for, for example. But uh, 
I don't know if you're, you're probably familiar with Peter Turkin's work about elite sure. overproduction and uh, how, uh, I mean, if we look back in history, at least according to the data he collected and interpreted, it seems that for revolutions to occur and to be successful and also to coups to occur sometimes and for political leaders to be deposed, for example, and regimes changed, um, apparently there needs to be some sort of elite overproduction where part of the elite, uh, uh, because of their own interests, uh, garner polit uh, public support and support the people to rise against a particular political system or regime like what happened in mm -hmm. France in the late 1800s, for example. Uh, that would be an example, but but I, I mean in this case, what I'm trying to discuss here is uh, if uh, you also consider those types of cases, and uh, since at a certain point there you also mentioned that, uh, of course, people um, have their own lives, and if they are not, uh, th that's not something that you said specifically, but if they are, they, they do not have a, some sort of guarantee in the future, if they are not supported by some sort of powerful person or people, then of course they would not be very willing, I guess, to participate in the revolution, because even if they have very little, I guess that rationally speaking, it would be better to keep what little they have than to just sacrifice it all. Perhaps it's easier to do that when we're talking about, for example, young men who do not have a romantic partner and do not have very high expectations for the future as happens when it comes to recruiting terrorists, for example. But uh, I mean, just uh, generally speaking, what do you think about all of this? Yeah, that totally makes sense. So I have two thoughts on this. First okay. is that um, overcoming collective action problems sometimes requires a fanatic a semi-elite group emerging who is uh, not responsive to incentives, who we can't model by using rational choice theory. They're just like Vladimir Lenin, for example, the Bolsheviks. Mm -hmm. They were just these leaders, these young men, educated men, who just wanted to create a revolution, even though all the incentives pointed towards a free riding and not doing anything, but they're just not responsive to incentives. And when those people create an organization like the Bolsheviks, when they create a communist party or something like that, then they can provide this, this minority, uh, elite minority can provide incentives, material incentives for the ordinary person to join. Various benefits and punishments if you do join if you, or if you don't join the elite grouping fighting against the Tsar or something like that. So that's one thing that's very important and I think it dovetails with what you said. The other thing is that I discuss in the book what was surprising to me when I was doing research for this book. I discuss so-called democracies from above. So what we were discussing up till now, up till your question, were democracies from below. You had yeah. this autocratic elite and then ordinary people rebel against it. And mm -hmm. this explains, like you mentioned, this explains 50 to 60 percent of all uh, democratic transitions in the past 200 years. But then there's still this 30 to 40 percent, a very large minority of cases that cannot be uh, explained by primarily referring to ordinary people rising up against the elite. Uh, but how can they then be explained? Well, by reference to various elite groupings like you did when you mentioned Peter Turchin's work. And I mention four sets of general reasons in the book for how you could understand using a rational choice perspective, what the conditions are under which an autocratic elite or a semi-autocratic elite would be willing to create a democratic uh, institutions for the normal person, because th this, is, this does not seem uh, intuitive, but it can become intuitive. Just think, for example, about the last set of the, the fourth set of reasons I mentioned in the book, that is yeah. the international climate. Sometimes it happens that you already are living in a world where there exist developed Western liberal democratic societies, and they perhaps want to give foreign aid to poor fledgling autocracies in Africa, let's say, whatever the reasons they have for that. They just want to give foreign aid and you as an autocratic dictator in this poor country you know that you can appropriate this 
foreign aid, but if the Western elites t tell you that they'll only give you this foreign aid in return for some democratic reforms, you as an autocratic leader can have some incentive for, for exchange of this money, some incentives to enact certain limited democratic reforms in your uh, otherwise autocratic country. Now, I'm not saying that this is a stable path toward democracy. I'm not saying that this uh, that um, the most um, prosperous democratic regimes will emerge out of this, but you can understand uh, in many ways why even absent of ordinary people, even absent the pressure coming from the masses, uh, the ruling elite or the non-ruling elite in a society would have certain incentives to enact various democratic reforms. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, just before we go on to other topics, just to summarize, you think that uh, probably the factor that played the biggest role in explaining the puzzle of democracy and the rise and spread of democracy across the world has to do with economic development? I, I, I do think that, yeah. Maybe, like I said, it explains only 50 or 60 percent of all cases. And even there, it's just one of the, I think, the primary causal factors, but not the only one. But I think that's definitely in, in the case of social science, that's a good uh, an important causal factor. And I would say that uh, there are many particular mechanisms through which economic development translates itself into more rights, into democracies. I mentioned in the book five such mechanisms. Let me just mention one or two here. So one thing is, and, and this again, I think has some uh, some uh, resonance with what you said before. Uh, mm -hmm. One mechanism is that when poor uh, pre-capitalist feudal societies started transitioning to the Industrial Revolution and to capitalist institu institutions, and when they started witnessing economic growth, there was a small stratum of people, middle class people, that expanded through time. And these um, middle class, the, the middle class between the ordinary people and the ruling elite, uh, this was a, an important vector of uh, the democracy or democracy creation, because you have to understand, Ricardo, that usually elites are worried when the ordinary people are pressing for democracy. Elites don't want to give them power because they think to themselves that these ordinary people won't stop at democratic rights, they won't stop at elections. They will want to go further. Maybe they will enact a communist revolution against them and they will use democratic means to expropriate the elite of their um, private property rights. Now, think about a society which is prosperous and so has, let's say, 40% of working classes, 40% of the middle classes, and 20% of elites. Well, in such a society, the elite knows that if the working classes ever got a bit rowdy and wanted to use democratic means to expropriate the elite, the elite knows that they have an ally in the form of the middle classes because the middle classes also have a stake in private property rights. The middle classes are not full-fledged elite, but they are somewhere on the spectrum between the ordinary masses and the ruling elite. And so therefore th their worries, the elite worries are soothed, that they are uh, toned down. And so elites are more prone to allow democratic reforms under sufficient pressure. Now, the other thing would be, for example, that economic development uh, uh, replaces um, uh, the previously uh, the, the previous majority of uh, ordinary people who were made up of peasants, uh, they, it replaces them with workers. And peasants are not a social actor that would be very amenable to collective action. Peasants are scattered across the countryside. They can't really strike. They can't really bring down the whole economy to a grinding halt, which would then um, hurt uh, the, the capitalists and the elites where they're most um, hurt at, uh, that is their pocketbook. Uh, instead, um, peasants don't make for good revolutionaries. Now, workers, this, this was an important insight from Karl Marx, workers are concentrated within factories, hundreds or thousands of them within factories. They can mobilize, they can uh, coordinate collective action easily. And also they are um, the the people who manage the economy in a way, right? They're not the managers, but still, when we are talking about the transportation or the manufacturing industry, if you stop working, then uh, if workers strike and don't come to the workplace, then these um, facilities will, will stop and the whole economy will be brought down. So they, they have a better uh, bargaining position. And there are many other mechanisms through which economic development explains why uh, the likelihood of the transition to democracy would be higher. So let's now talk about one of the main issues people point to that they see occur in across democracies. This is something that, for example, economists like Brian Kaplan talk a lot about, 
and uh, even has an entire book on it. So is the average voter well informed? Yeah, somebody who likes democracy, I was dismayed. I, I was um, negatively surprised when I discovered that no, no, the average voter is quite uninformed. In, even in highly educated, um, most developed uh, democratic uh, societies in, in the West, um, there are differences between countries. I, Ipsos Mori has this um, political knowledge scale that goes through from zero to 100. I think 100 is the, the best score, uh, total knowledge. And uh, usually Scandinavian countries like Sweden rank the highest, but even they only get to about 50 or 49. So that's, that's definitely not uh, strong knowledge. And you, you then have some societies like I think Italy sometimes, uh, which are at the bottom of the pack, uh, around the score of, I don't know, 10 or something like that. Uh, so uh, voter knowledge is definitely varied, but uh, overall it's, it's quite low. Uh, you can look at data coming from the United States because we have the best research from that country. And the, surprisingly, the United States doesn't uh, perform the, the worst. Uh, so it's quite representative of the broader uh, democratic world. And uh, you can look at American national election surveys. And those indicate that in, in the previous 10 or 20 years, we can say that the American electorate was composed of four groups of voters. The top 25% who know quite a lot then the next 25% who are weakly informed, they know something, but they're weakly informed. Then you have the next 25% who are basically ignorant. They, they don't perform better than chance. It's basically a, a coin toss with them. And then you have the bottom 25% of voters who are actively misinformed, who know less than nothing. A sheer chance would perform better on a test than, than they do. Um, and um, you, I go through the book in the book through various uh, recent political events uh, monumental political events like the mm -hmm. British decision for to, to exit the European Union, mm -hmm. uh, the Brexit vote, right? And I, um, I um, draw data from surveys before the referendum occurred, and the data are, again, quite pessimistic. For example, 25% uh, of British voters mistakenly thought that the European Union is a non-democratic entity. Another 25% didn't know whether the European Union is democratic or not. And then you have um, Brexit voters. The majority of those voting in favor of Brexit mistakenly thought against all government reports and against the social scientific literature they thought that migrants coming into Britain uh, cause more crime than domestic population. Uh, they mistakenly thought that um, migrants take out of the welfare state more than they bring into it. Uh, they mistakenly thought that um, migrants cause higher unemployment rates among domestic population and so on. Uh, maybe just one data point is that uh, there are 5% uh, among the whole British population, only 5% of Brits uh, are um, Muslims. When you ask people before the Brexit referendum how many um, Brits are Muslims, um, people, uh, the ordinary Brit overestimated the share by three times. So 15%, not 5%. And those in favor of Brexit thought it's 20%. So every fifth Brit obviously is, is a Muslim, uh, they thought. Uh, so, so really, they are uh, quite uh, uninformed. And um, this, I think, is um, very problematic because these are not some abstract, abstruse questions like um, how many um, judges sit on the Supreme Court, uh, what are the surnames of all the judges sitting on the Supreme Court, do you know by heart all of the articles in your constitution? That doesn't matter. But these uh, questions, I mean, I would say that this uh, fact of ignorance was the leading cause of um, uh, British people deciding for this calamitous decision to exit the European Union. L think, think about it yourself, Ricardo. If you really thought that the reality was such that migrants are destroying your country, if you really thought that um, one fifth of the population in your society has a religion which you don't understand, if you really thought all of those things, and if you really thought that um, exiting the European Union, allegedly a non-democratic dictatorial entity, would solve all of, your, all of your problems, well, you and I would probably be in favor of Brexit. So these, the, the, the fact of ignorance, I think, is, is a very, has um, real consequences for electoral prospects. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we'll also get into some of the reasons behind the fact that people usually spe uh, generally speaking are not that well informed uh, and also how sometimes still people voters get things right but before that uh, I mean uh, 
uh, is it really so important for them to be well informed? I mean, how problematic is it really that people are generally not so well informed? I mean, I'm asking you that not just because it's important to be to get things empirically correct here, but also because there are people that use this knowledge to push for political agendas that perhaps are not so good, like, for example, saying that perhaps we should just ditch democracy because people are stupid and people elect the wrong people. And uh, sometimes they push for systems that uh, if they are not straight out aristocracy, they are very much along the lines of aristocracy, like just saying that the most well-informed people should be the ones to make all decisions. So, uh, I mean, what do you think about that? We should be careful here. You're right. Uh, your previous guest, um, and I think an awesome social scientist, Hugo Mercier, uh, with his colleagues, Henry Farrell and one other colleague, I think, uh, they just published a piece, I think a month ago, critiquing Kaplan, Brennan and Salmin uh, in, in the way that you're indicating. And I don't completely agree with their critique. I think there's lots of useful uh, stuff to get from Salmin, uh, Kaplan and, Br and Brennan. Uh, but um, I, I do think that there are some issues, first of all, with pointing out all of these errors in voters, like I said, do you really need to know all of the names of all of the judges on the Supreme Court? I don't think so. Do you really need to know to be an informed, uh, proper voter, uh, all the articles in your constitution by heart? I don't think so. So we can play at this game. Uh, what do the voters know and what they, the, the, the don't they know? And we could be mm, quite um, uh, capricious here. I don't want to do that. I would just like to look at uh, monumental facts that they get wrong, like the ones uh, related to what migrants cause or, or don't cause, uh, whether the unemployment level is 30% this year in your uh, society or just 5%. Those, those things they need to get right. And sometimes they really don't get them right. So I think there is some to the critique of uh, something to the critique of voters, but at the same time we should not push it too far. And also I would say that all these other alternatives, like um, um, Brennan, Jason Brennan talks about epistocracy, like you said, the rule of those who know, uh, an elite rule. Uh, even he is quite clear that that is basically more or less just a philosophical exercise. He thinks that a democracy right now, liberal democracy, is the best thing we got. Or paraphrasing Churchill, it's the war of all systems apart from all the other ones that we tried. So even they, so Ka Kaplan and Brennan and so on, they admit that democracy is currently the best we got. We could tweak it a bit. Maybe um, um, Somin talks about food voting. Uh, we don't have time to go into food voting, but there are various suggestions, some of which are not elite. Food voting is not something that would be an aristocratic elite proposal. Um, but I agree with your general impression that one can make too much out of uh, the, the, the fact of voter ignorance, sure. And so uh, one thing that really plays a big role, or at least you explore in the book as playing a big role uh, in our political behavior is our tribalism or our tribal behavior in more general terms. So where does it stem from and uh, how do you think, uh, how important do you think it is and how important of a role do you think it plays in modern day politics? I think tribalism is a compounding factor. Uh, so even apart from tribalism, and I'll get right back to it in a second, even apart from tribalism, I would say that just using the ordinary tools of rational choice analysis, uh, not, not tweaking or not um, filling up uh, a human's uh, psychology too much with empirical detail like, like tribalism, which we do have to do, but even before doing that, uh, the fact that uh, democratic voting is a sort of collective action problem, a sort of tragedy of the commons, explains a large share of why people are, are, are ignorant. Like you yourself know, Ricardo, even though we have a, a duty, a norm that you have to vote, and you have to be informed when um, casting your ballot, you do feel, and most people feel, even if they don't intentionally recognize it, you do feel that, Ricardo, your personal vote, or my personal vote, it has an infinitesimally small chance of affecting um, elections in the end. If I didn't vote in Slovenian elections one year ago, the way that I did vote, uh, 
nothing would actually change. If we hold everything else constant, just change up my vote or make me an absentee ballot uh, or some, somebody who didn't come to the election, nothing changes. You don't even see it at the fourth decimal point when counting out all the, the um, election or the ballots. Uh, so people, I think, do feel that individually speaking, a single person's vote doesn't count. And in that sense, we we don't we um, have to understand that people don't want to spend the time and energy in this busy world uh, researching all the social scientific facts about migration and the unemployment and the effects of the minimum wage because they feel what am i even doing in the end even though if i spend 6 months of my time and energy researching all of these facts which is a for most people that is an um, something that they they would rather not do uh, an uncomfortable process and then casting your vote your informed vote after these six months won't make a difference. So most people just say, ah, I don't want to swear, but um, let, let's just not be informed and just cast our vote. So this is what's called rational ignorance. Now, this fact is now compounded when we add tribalism. The fact that I think, and I reference some good evolutionary psychological studies in the paper, uh, in, in my book when discussing the topic of uh, tribalism, the fact that people are tribal by, um, by nature, I would say. Of course, socialization and norms play into it, but we have been evolved to be tribalistic, to divide ourselves into the uh, us and them categories, to demonize the other side and not really listen to it, and to respect our side, to display loyalty to, us, uh, to our side, never stray from what our side says. So this is tribalism. I think this has um, made wonders for reproductive success of our ancestors. Uh, people are, uh, human beings are such social creatures that if we are left to fend off for ourselves without a group, you won't survive. So that's why you had to stick with a group and those who had mutations, um, uh, making them more prone to tribalistic behavior, those were our ancestors. We are their descendants, right? Uh, all, all other people with mutations, making them for good scientists who are not tribalistic and weighing the pros and cons of, vari of various groups, they were left to the side and they died in the jungle. Um, so I think uh, we should recognize the fact that um, tribalism is biologically rooted, not to give up, not to say, oh, okay, so then you can do anything, it's inevitable. No, we both know that evolutionary psychology is a field that is highly sensitive to um, environmental environmental cues, um, evolution, human evolutionary psychology is highly uh, context dependent. So we, we can have certain social environmental interventions that would tone down tribalism and would make us would make political debate and voting behavior more akin to maybe a dispassionate science project than it is right now. Uh, but um, we're just writing op-eds and columns uh, exhortating people, let's not be as tribal, uh, that won't work because it's deeply rooted in our biology. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, over the course of what you said, you've already mentioned some other cognitive biases that, that play a role here. So let me ask you another question about voters. So even if most of us are pretty ill-informed on politics, uh, there are apparently still things that voters get right. So what are some of those things? Definitely. You can sense the tension in what I'm talking about. If you uh, remember the first part of our interview, where I said that the liberal democracies are very stable, they are the most economically developed in the world. So how come, how is this possible if voters, the ones steering democratic societies, are so uninformed. Well, because it's not true that they're completely uninformed. When it comes to certain big issues, very important issues, they get things right, like you said. Let me mention two of them. First of all, voters, even though they get the details of migration, the effects and causes of unemployment and so on wrong, they still uh, recognize when things go really bad, when you have really bad actors in your office. Uh, so when um, politicians are engaging in scandalous behavior, when they are creating uh, uh, enormous corrupt deals and issues in the country, uh, when they are um, engaging in affairs and so on, if the media are reporting on that, and usually they are in um, democratic societies, people do notice that, they gossip, 
uh, among each other and they just they come to a realization that this is a really bad guy we should not re-elect him or we should even maybe um, strive for premature elections to to get rid of him they take to the streets they protest this, this has happened in uh, portugal this has happened in slovenia think of uh, 10 years ago after the uh, european uh, economic crisis and uh, our austerity measures people rebelled against that not completely successfully but they did rebel against austerity and uh, certain politicians listened to them and there was some positive effects from that so this is one thing the other thing is that mm, voters do manage to get right what has been happening with their economy uh, in broad terms in the preceding years to an election this is called retrospective voting in political science and it, it is a strong correlation between how well an economy has been doing in the um, years prior to an election and then the election prospects of various uh, incumbent leaders and other uh, opposition or, or challengers uh, so uh, in, in that sense it seems that voters think to themselves before casting a vote wait uh, in the past few years was the economy growing or shrinking were we in a crisis or in a um, in a boom and if they come to the conclusion that the economy was shrinking they say well let's punish the bastard who did this to us and they don't re-elect him and uh, the, the reverse is also true if the economy has been booming they say to themselves okay this guy has been quite quite nice to us let's let's reward him and give him another chance now some scholars like jason brennan and brian kaplan would challenge me and they would say sure tibor sure um, there is retrospective voting but um, voters cannot disentangle causation from correlation they see uh, one president they see a growing economy and they say the guy has been responsible for that while in reality maybe the president has done nothing to help the economy the economy was booming completely apart from the actions of the ruling party Yes, this is possible, and some studies do suggest that, but recent meta-analysis, recent big studies from Europe and the United States show that typically voters can uh, decipher co correlation for, from causation, and they can fairly attribute responsibility for uh, economies either booming or uh, um, delving into a recession. So that, I think, is, is a, an optimistic fact about voters. Okay, so uh, since, since you mentioned people protesting on the streets in Portugal and Slovenia like 10, 11 years ago, I, I mean, let me, uh, before I ask you the, ne the next question, let me just say that uh, 11 years ago in September of 2012, uh, people in Portugal uh, gathered in, uh, 500,000 people gathered oh. in, on the streets of Lisbon to, pro to protest against austerity measures, and I really miss <laughs> those, those times. times. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In Slovenia, in 2011, 12, and 13, but we, we are such a small country, so uh, you have to take these numbers with a grain of salt. Uh, it, this is a lot for us. In Slovenia, the, this same austerity uh, protests, I think, attracted uh, something to the tune of 30, 40, or 50,000 people, which for such a small country, we only have 2 million uh, yeah. residents, is quite a lot. And, and yeah, th th those, were, uh, those were interesting times. <laughs> for sure. So let's get into a problem that is not so much about individuals, but more a systemic problem. So market failure, where is it and how does it occur in this case in democracies? Typically, we presume, with good reason, that markets work quite well, that markets don't fail, ma markets succeed. Uh, that means that uh, when certain conditions are uh, fulfilled, like um, there's enough competition, uh, all economic actors are fairly informed, and you have complete property rights in, the, in what has been exchanged or produced, then markets are efficient. They are efficient in the technical sense that's sometimes also called Pareto efficiency. That simply means that when Pareto efficiency is achieved and markets should lead us there when Pareto efficiency efficiency is achieved that means that nobody can improve their position without worsening uh, the position of one other person so all positive sum interactions that are that were potentially present have been exhausted have been created um, and in, a, in another way i could say that markets being efficient markets succeeding simply means that they create the optimal allocation of resources the optimal mix of costs and benefits from production and exchange from society's perspective there will always be costs but um, the ratio between costs and benefits is maximized now, under certain conditions, markets also fail. Fail to do what? 
fail to achieve Pareto efficiency, fail to produce this optimal mix, fail to exhaust all of the positive sum interactions that are uh, latently present in a society. Take the example of air pollution. Nobody owns the air and that means that spontaneously on the market, when things are getting produced, um, the price of various goods will not reflect the costs of air pollution because there is no party to the, to the exchange who could assert his own property rights over the air and who could say, pay me these costs because you're polluting my air by producing certain goods. And because uh, these uh, costs of air pollution are the technical uh, way to express it is externalized, that means that uh, the optimal mix of costs and benefits has not been produced from a society's perspective. Too much air pollution pollution has been produced. Why? Well, because the price of uh, cars and the price of gasoline and so on doesn't reflect all of the costs, doesn't reflect the costs of air pollution. This means that the price is artificially lower than it would have been if complete property rights existed and if somebody could assert these extra air pollution costs. And this means that from society's perspective, too many costs are being produced for a, a given amount of benefits. And in this sense, we say that the market uh, has failed. And this happens in, in market societies, whether they're democratic or whether they're not democratic. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm about to ask you now about government failure. But yeah. just before we get into that, since we're talking about markets here, I mean, sometimes you hear from libertarians that in this case, it's usually the most extreme libertarians, but sometimes you hear from people, even some of them are scholars themselves, uh, that, I mean, you should, just, you should just let the market work and, I mean, we wouldn't even need, a, ideally, a state or a government. But does that make any sense at all? Can the market even operate without a state? I think you should take a look at David Friedman's book. David Friedman is the son of Milton Friedman, and David Friedman is much more libertarian than Milton Friedman was. Uh, he's an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, you should look at uh, his book called The Machinery of Freedom. He lays out a theoretical blueprint for an anarcho-capitalist society without any state. Now, I uh, think this is a, a very um, good attempt the best attempt I have ever come across, the, the one that is the most convincing to me. But in the end, I think it definitely fails. Even the, the best attempt to uh, outline an uh, anarcho-capitalist utopia doesn't work out. There are two problems, I think, with that, Ricardo. First of all, David Friedman says that all of the state, um, state capacities or all, all of what state does, that would be, in his society, would be decentralized and various private agencies would do that. You would have private courts, you would have private uh, bureaucracies and so on. So you could still fix market failures, let's say, uh, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but he would say you just wouldn't have um, a state. You would have all of these decentralized firms that would compete on the market and would reap all of the benefits of competition, which the state doesn't have. Now, I think he overestimates or he forgets about two things when proposing that. First of all, he relies on what's called the shadow of the future. When when somebody says, "What? but, but Friedman, uh, how would that work? Uh, firms would poison us. Coca-Cola companies, which, which, would, which would not be regulated, they would just put poison uh, because that's cheaper, for example, in our food. And so what would you do then? And he says, no, no, no. Think about the shadow of the future. These are profit maximizing firms. They want to have customers even five years from now. So they wouldn't poison you. They have an incentive not to do that. And yes, that works to some extent. But what about certain rare forms of cancer that are only detected over 30 year time periods when uh, the managers of these firms would um, uh, already be be different. I mean, this doesn't work completely. The, the shadow of the, of the future is not a good enough mechanism, I think. And then the other point is that he says uh, what the shadow of the future wouldn't take care of, competition would take care of. So all of these competing agencies would have the best interest of the customer at heart because if one of them tried to increase uh, prices or collude or be corrupt, the other uh, company would have an incentive to offer a better deal to the customers and attract the customers from the first firm to the second firm. And they, yeah, I think that works to a certain extent. But again, we were just talking about market failures. Competition doesn't work always. You can't have complete property rights. You can't have complete information. You can't have always sufficient amount of competition. So in the end, it's a good attempt, but I don't think that works. I mean, and another thing that is very interesting is uh, just assuming that uh, people who own companies or are CEOs and whatever always have 
uh, or always look or plan long term. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that's always the case. And also another point is uh, if they always take into account uh, customer service and customer satisfaction, then why do we need customer rights? Yeah, true, true. Yeah, I agree. Uh, of course, they would say uh, um, to challenge us, they would say, uh, sure, but all of the issues that you have in economic actors that you just mentioned now that, that they don't have long term horizons, they would say all of those uh, are recreated in political actors. And we'll talk about uh, this now when it comes to government failure. And uh, so, so we have to be careful about dismissing smart libertarians like David Friedman. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I think we can still make a good intellectual case against them. And it's no surprise that um, most people are not libertarians, even the most educated, objective, and not corrupted by ideology, rationalist type people. Most of them are not uh, libertarians for good reason, I think. Okay, so let's leave the libertarians alone for a second <laughs> and talk about government failure then. So uh, how does it occur in democracies? Yeah, I, I, I think government failure would be the same thing as we said with uh, market failure, just that now it's created by political actors, by states, not by, uh, by firms or uh, capitalists. So government failure is the condition or the process, whereas where, where um, governments with their policies don't create an optimal mix of costs and benefits for the society. They don't bring us towards the condition of Pareto efficiency. Some uh, positive, some interactions have been left on the table and have not been uh, uh, enacted. And um, this is important because uh, decades ago, economists sometimes thought in the following way. They diagnosed market failures and then they said where markets fail, governments can succeed. And why would that be so? They postulated that the behavioral assumptions behind the um, actions of economic and political actors are radically different. Uh, so they said that economic actors are selfish. That's why uh, market failure sometimes occurs and they're not fully informed. Again, that's why sometimes market failure occurs. But they postulated that political actors are publicly minded, are publicly spirited. They are uh, altruistic. They have the best interests of their populace, of the citizenry uh, in mind and they're uh, fairly informed and so on. And from that, it, it could be easily deduced that where markets fail, governments can fix them. However, public choice uh, analysis or public choice theory rightly warns us that we shouldn't um, assume this thesis of behavioral asymmetry. Instead, we should assume the thesis of behavioral symmetry. We should say that economic actors are humans, just like political actors are humans. So if economic actors are presumed to be selfish, so too should politicians. And again, we should just remind ourselves of um, Trump or Bolsonaro or Orban or almost every other politician in existence, even those who are not undermining democracy in such a direct way. Of course, they are interested in wealth, in um, power, in prestige, just like capitalists are. Now, there are incentives and uh, structural reasons why democracy, given free and independent media, regular elections, why, why the incentives are then translating these politicians' um, self-interest into something that's usually good for us, like um, competition is translating capitalists' uh, self-interest into something that's good for us, the consumers, uh, most of the time. Uh, but still, we should uh, assume that the psychology of politicians and uh, capitalists is the same. And I completely take on board that uh, idea. And then we come to the phenomenon of um, regulatory capture and rent seeking as two instances of how government failure happens. So what can happen, Ricardo, as you know too well, is that um, some capitalists can come uh, to the office of um, various politicians and say to them, let's make a deal. We, the capitalists, will offer you, the politicians, uh, something in exchange for you giving us, let's say, higher tariffs, which would prevent foreign competition from destroying our own domestic capitalist uh, industry. Uh, we, if you politicians give us uh, high tariffs on uh, Chinese imports, we domestic producers can raise our prices. Uh, and we won't be competed out from by, by Chinese. And so um, the customers of this country will be ripped off. They will have to pay higher prices and we will have higher margins. Now, you uh, So you're talking about lobbying there. And we're lobbying. That would be one example. Yeah. And, and then politicians uh, can say uh, can say back to them. Yeah. But why? What do you 
what do you uh, promise uh, to give me in return? And capitalists can say, well, you'll get a cushy job in our firm. When your political career is over, you'll have a nice salary. So the, 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 gist, the gist of the idea is that they make reciprocal, um, benefit, mutually beneficial deals, but the public is screwed over. That, that's called lobbying or corruption or rent seeking. Uh, and even um, sometimes uh, when we defend regulations, these regulations, government regulations, are used by capitalists capitalists through the mechanism of rent seeking and lobbying, they're used to, to, to regulate themselves in such a way to increase their bottom line and again just hurt the consumer. So government failure uh, occurs in this way and this is something that libertarians are usually correct uh, in pointing out. They just, I think, go too far because they only focus, or some of them, the most radical ones, only focus on government failure, but don't focus on market failure nearly as much. Or they just say that every time governments do anything, it's always going to be a failure, which, are, of course, is not the case. Mm -hmm. So I have a handful more questions here to ask you. Uh, first of all, where do you think public, public choice analysis fail? Well, this would be one example. Public choice analysis is correct in noting government failure. Public choice theory is correct that governments, for various reasons, including selfishness and not being, um, not having long time horizons, just uh, waiting for another uh, re-election and that's it. You don't care about what happens to the country after that. Uh, for these reasons, governments will, first of all, create sometimes market failures when none existed before. Other times when market failures already existed, governments will not do a good job of fixing them. And sometimes governments will fix market failures, but just to a certain degree. Again, they won't be optimal in their, uh, in their actions. So in that sense, public choice theory, I think, is very, uh, a very fruitful endeavor. But at the same time, I think there are two issues that, that uh, public choice was, um, at least in the past, quite blind uh, to. Uh, the first is what we already mentioned, and that is that they um, see government failure everywhere. They, sometimes they say, you don't even need to do empirical investigation. We can just deduce from our theoretical assumptions Then, whenever governments uh, try to do anything, they'll fail. But this is not the way to go. You have to look at empirical evidence, and I do so in the book. And what the empirical evidence coming out of the United States, and we know that the United States is not even uh, a that, fell, uh, that well of, um, of a functioning of a government. Uh, Sweden, for example, would have much greater state capacity. But even in the United States, uh, uh, the empirical evidence shows that sometimes governments fix, at least in part, market failures. Well, other times they, they don't uh, do anything to fix them. Um, and the other issue, I think, with public choice theory is that um, at least decades earlier, in, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, public choice theorists didn't know what to do with the fact that you cannot explain, based on um, classical rational choice theory, why people vote. Because, like, like we said, uh, Ricardo, uh, people don't have any material incentive to vote. Your, your individual vote won't change anything, so why would, you, why would you go out and vote? Well, the obvious answer is because people don't just do what's in their material interest. They also have certain social norms and certain, certain duties that they want to perform. And in developed democracies, we have a duty to, to vote. And uh, the um, public choice theorists didn't, didn't know uh, how to incorporate that fact into their theoretical apparatus, but that has changed in the 80s and 90s with um, uh, theorists such as Jeffrey Brennan, not, not Jason Brennan, but Jeffrey Brennan mm -hmm. and um, other people. So I think this is now less of an issue for them. Mm -hmm. So now let me ask you another question about democracy and its effects. So do, do we know if democracy really contributes to peace? And by the way, let me just tell people that you've also done some work on the anthropology of war and the anthropology of peace systems. And I've had a few people, anthropologists, that work on that on the show. And there's lots of discussion between the so-called deep rooters and the shallow rooters. And if war is really that ancient or more recent and if it's part of human nature or not. And I mean, it's, it's a very interesting and fascinating debate, debate from an intellectual perspective, but let's not get into that at least today. But uh, I mean, there, there are people out there and I've interviewed also some of them like Azar Gat, Steven Pinker. I mean, Steven Pinker, I, I don't think I talked with him exactly about this, about the relationship between uh, liberal democratic capitalism societies and peace exactly but I mean people have been talking for example about the long peace the new peace uh, 
and they usually, at least one of the factors they associate it with is the rise and spread of democracy over the past few decades. So, but is that really the case? Is, that, is it really the case that democracy contributes to peace? I would say that it is, and we have quite strong evidence for that. Like you mentioned, there are many factors. Uh, one other factor is capitalism or economic development, ho wholly apart from democracy. Uh, but I think the best evidence we have is um, for democratic peace. So let me just say that democratic peace means that uh, democracies don't fight each other. Democratic dyads or pairs of democratic states don't fight each other, but democracies do fight um, uh, autocracies. And of course, autocracies fight among, uh, amongst each other. Um, and again, depending on how you measure democracy, it's not necessarily the case that democracies have never ever uh, fought any shooting war between each other. But um, the frequency is much, 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 much lower than among mixed diets. So pairs of democratic and autocratic states and pairs of, of course, autocratic states. And um, yes, the evidence we have is quite strong. In the past 30 years, 30 years, there have been many attempts to overturn the correlation between democracy and peace, and none of them have succeeded. Uh, there are even recent studies, I think published last year, uh, recent studies claiming that the correlation between uh, democracy and peace is as robust as robust as the correlation between smoking and lung cancer. Uh, and um, some of those studies say that uh, if the correlation were to be overturned, if we were to find a con confounder which explained all of the association between democracy and uh, peace by another means, um, that would have to be, that confounder would have to be, statistically speaking, five times stronger than any confounder we've uncovered in this literature so far. And that seems almost completely impossible. So I would say definitely if there's any candidate for um, uh, for uh, peace uh, in modern times, that's democracy. Absolutely. Now, there are many mechanisms, many theoretical accounts why that would be the case, because somebody might uh, ask, well, why would democracy, the, the fact that people have freedoms, why would that reduce um, warring and just with other democracies, but not with autocracies? Uh, so uh, I go through three sets of theoretical mechanisms. I think the most important, the, the most, the strongest ones in the book, and I can just briefly summarize them here. One has to do with um, democratic institutions the fact that political leaders, who are usually the ones who start wars, they are more responsible or more responsive to popular will in democracy. And of course, the, the ordinary person doesn't want, at least theoretically, we would assume that the ordinary person doesn't want uh, a, a war break, breaking out because the ordinary person has to be the one fighting in that war. And if the politicians are responsive to the popular will and the popular will is against war, well, that, that would explain why you wouldn't have wars. But it wouldn't explain why you would, we wouldn't have wars just with other democracies, but still you have wars with other autocracies. So there are some complications with that mechanism. The other mechanism has to do with costly signaling. Uh, and here, th this is a bit too complicated for us right now, but people can go and read the book. The idea is just that um, democracies can, when they meet each other on the geopolitical terrain, they have an easier way of showing each other what their power is, military power, and how strong their resolve is when it comes to a certain conflict or crisis. And so they didn't, don't, don't have to do what uh, everybody else has to do. That is, they don't have to test their power and resolve on the actual battlefield. They can signal each other what their um, power is and re their resolve. And then when they realize that one side is much po more powerful than the other one, they can just sit down uh, at the diplomatic table and um, resolve the conflict in nonviolent means. Because both of them, even the more powerful side, would have... Um, uh, losses. They, they, um, they, they would both have certain costs if they fight each other, so they can uh, create a positive sum uh, solution in that way through diplomatic means. Um, and then lastly, we could talk about norms. So the idea is that um, within democracies, political leaders grow up internalizing norms of nonviolent peace, um, uh, nonviolent or peaceful conflict resolution. I think, uh, Ricardo, to a time when you had some issue with, with a fellow uh, Portuguese citizen when you had an accident or something like that. Well, you call the police and then the, the judges intervene. You, you don't have to fight him. Uh, the institutions take care of that. Now, the idea is that political leaders in democracies internalize the fact that you uh, don't bully people around when you get into a car crash. 
And so when it comes to a geopolitical crisis, democratic leaders are presumed much more than autocratic leaders to be attuned to non-violent means of conflict resolution, and that should make them more uh, peaceful. Again, there are some issues with this, this mechanism. I think the strongest one, both theoretically and uh, empirically, is the middle one, the, the costly signaling one. But um, all of that, I think, is much better than all of the other causal mechanisms that, that some people throw out in explaining um, contemporary peace. Mm -hmm. Okay, so two more questions, uh, because uh, you also address them in your book, and I think they are both very interesting. So around uh, three decades ago, Francis Fukuyama uh, famously published his book, The End of History, where he made a very interesting argument. Uh, could you summarize his argument, and do you think that three decades later it still holds up or not? Sure, I think it definitely holds up, not completely, but given how much people make fun or made fun of Fukuyama, even I was one of those people 10 years ago without even reading him, but it's just a, a rite of passage to make fun of Fukuyama when you're an <laughs> undergrad. Uh, I think that given all of these um, misguided critiques, he definitely holds up. So he was, uh, like you said, writing at the end of uh, Cold War in 1989, and he was observing an interesting trend. That is that um, even communist governments like the, United, the Soviet Union and uh, communist China, all of them started adopting some elements of capitalism and democracy. Communist China, more capitalism than democracy, but um, Soviet Russia, even some aspects of uh, democracy. The reforms were called in Soviet uh, Union uh, perestroika and glasnost. And in uh, the communist China, you had, after the death of Mao Zedong and with the rise of uh, Deng Xiaoping, you had the market revolution, market reforms, so uh, adopting capitalist institutions. And he was thinking to himself, look at this, fascism, one big alternative to capitalist democracy, has been defeated, had been defeated in Second World War. Now communism is also seemingly being defeated at the end of Cold War because communists th themselves have started adopting capitalist and democratic institutions. So even before communism actually crumbled in, um, in, in later years then, uh, Fukuyama already saw the, the coming uh, defeat of communism. So his thesis uh, on the base of that uh, could be summarized in three parts. First of all, he um, concluded that ideologically speaking, there seemed to be no new alternatives to capitalism and democracy. Uh, one was fascism, the other was communism, but it, ideologically speaking, nobody defends that anymore. And even when some people try to come up with new ideological alternatives to capitalism and democracy, nothing new seems to have been produced uh, in the past uh, 30 years. The second uh, subthesis of Fukuyama is that um, in the 90s, every country in the world, became, almost every country in the world adopted capitalism. Maybe, okay, North Korea, Venezuela, Cuba, those are the exceptions, but all other countries, even communist China today, the nominally communist China today, all of them are capitalist. So not just ideologically, but in practice, in the real world, Capitalism has seemingly triumphed. And then lastly, the third subthesis was um, regarding democracy. He noted the growing, um, the growing rate of democracy, and he said to himself, okay, still only 40% of all political regimes in the world can be classified as democracy, so not the majority, but if you look at modernization theory, which we discussed in this interview, the fact that economic development leads to or increases the probability of uh, leading to democratic transition, he thought to himself, as long as over the coming century or two, every society, with the exception of perhaps North Korea, because they are capitalist, every society would grow in time, every society should become uh, democratic. And now, if you ask me whether all of these three theses have uh, held up, I would say, yeah, they definitely have. Ideologically speaking, think of uh, Bernie Sanders. What does Bernie Sanders, as a big um, alternatives guy, what does he suggest? Sweden. That is liberal democratic uh, society, capitalist society, with some tinkering, more protections for workers, of course, uh, collectivized bargaining and so on. But this is just tinkering around the margins of capitalism and democracy. So not a big alternative after all. What about all these um, populists, uh, Orban, Bolsonaro and so on? None of them challenge capitalism. They do challenge democracy, 
But here we'll see the democratic recession has been one um, one occurrence that has that uh, has shaken me in my faith in Fukuyama. Uh, but but we'll see because of modernization theory. As long as Orbán, Bolsonaro, Trump, and other populists are committed to growth, to economic development, to capitalism, I think this is going to be what kicks them out of the office come 10, 20, or 30 years. It's going to take a long time, but over the long term, 100 years, for example, I think Fukuyama will be proven right. We'll have more democracies than today, not less. Okay, so my last question then, and of course it's very related to my previous one, do you think that there are good reasons to think that liberal democratic capitalist societies will tend to emerge victorious or be more successful in terms of spreading more across the globe than authoritarian state capitalist societies? Nothing is inevitable, but I think the probability is on the side of um, democratic capitalist societies, yes. So I don't think China offers uh, a realistic alternative. And uh, this is so for reasons we already went uh, through uh, a bit. So first of all, democratic peace. Um, this enables lots of stability for democratic liberal uh, capitalist societies, but not so much for autocracies. Uh, then I didn't mention that when democracies do fight wars with autocracies, they are usually um, on the victorious side. So in the past 200 years, 93% uh, of times that democra democracies fought autocracies, democracies won over, while autocracies only win when they fight against democracies or other autocracies 60% of the time. Um, th that is also something very important when considering long-term viability of different systems. Mm -hmm. Then you also have to think of um, the various virtuous feedback loops that exist within democratic societies between capitalism and democracy. We have studies like the Rhone, Asimoglus, uh, and other uh, uh, colleagues who show that democracies holding everything else constant, democracies grow at a higher pace than autocracies. So they have more economic development. And that is important for military strength. Uh, military strength comes from economic strength. And uh, if democ democracies uh, grow um, faster, they would also be more military, uh, militarily powerful. Then we could also say, looking at China, uh, that I think that um, uh, current existing contemporary large-scale autocracies have only two paths in front of them when it comes to development. One path looks like this. You start introducing democratic reforms and this will make you, uh, this will enable you to reap economic rewards, but this will also turn you into democracy. So Xi Jinping, the current Chinese leader, doesn't want that. Okay, so this is off the table. The other path is for you to stay an autocrat but that would mean that you would grow slower because democracy, democratic rights uh, have certain positive feedback loops when it comes to economic development. Moreover, you can look at China, how its growth rates have been slashed in half. 10% uh, per year 10 years ago, now only 5% per year, even excluding the pandemic um, pandemic, pandemic uh, period. Uh, moreover, uh, various economic reforms that uh, Xi Jinping uh, promised 10 years ago, none of that uh, has happened. And no, none of that was um, created. And the, autocra the, the dynamic, the internal the dynamic of autocratic regimes make it hard for you to uh, enact um, positive economic reforms. So all of that and many other factors, I think, make the, the um, ostensible Chinese alternative to the West not really uh, a viable alternative. Okay, great. So the book is again, Rational Choice and Democratic Government, a sociological approach. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box, like I did last time with your other book, Capitalism for Realists. And again, I'm also linking our first interview in the description box. So Dr. Ruta, just before we go, would you like to tell people again where they can find you and your work on the internet? Yeah, sadly, I have, when it comes to social media profiles, I just have Facebook, which is a dead platform, but you can find me by um, Googling my name or, or Facebooking my name there and add me as a friend. I'll, I'll gladly accept the request. I don't have a Twitter account or an Instagram account, and they can um, read my uh, scholarly work on ResearchGate. Just to Google my name and my surname, maybe add the word ResearchGate uh, in the search term, and you'll find all of my uh, research there freely available. I um, uh, update it regularly. Okay, so I'm also leaving links to that in the description box of the interview. And thank you so much again for coming back on the show. As I said at the beginning, it's always uh, uh, fun to talk to you.
So thanks, thanks. This has been fun. Thanks, Ricardo. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please do not forget to like it, share, comment and subscribe. And if you like more generally what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. You, get, you have all of the links in the description of this interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larsen, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Whittingbird Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Enrique Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Robert Windegger, Ruinacio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Triago Dunes, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Librand, John Linear, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tam Amal, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desar Auzo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adan Arusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Stasevski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pans Cortez, Usla Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Morten Eichland, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stéphanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Olozen, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Eriksson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amory Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilly Jr., Holt Erickbun, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassis, Tom Roth, the RPMD, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Manuel Oliveira, Kimberly Johnson, and Benjamin Galbart. A special thanks to my producers, these are Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Tom Vanegdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.